Hello, I'm Mr. Eliasson, and welcome to World History. Today we're going to talk about one of the greatest periods in Chinese history in our continued survey across Asia. We're going to talk about the rise and fall of the Ming Dynasty, one of China's three major dynastic golden ages, as it were. So let's dive in. Here are some of our objectives for today. Take a moment to make note of them, and we'll dive in and start with our story. When we last left China, they were ruled by the Mongol Yuan dynasty. We hopefully remember that the Mongols were, of course, these steppe warriors who created a great empire. The, gr the grandson of the great Khan uh, Gen of Genghis, Kublai, I, seized control of China, established his own dynasty, and then became very Chinese in his practices, putting into place the examination system, redredging the Grand Canal, doing all the sort of things that Chinese emperors traditionally did. But in the later Yuan dynasty, a couple things happened. One, the Black Death devastated the population, leading to significant loss of life. Kublai I's successors were not as competent as he was. Uh, there was high taxes. They issued too much paper money to try to stimulate the economy, leading to inflation. They locked out non-Mongol Mongols out of the top rank of the examination system, which angered the Han Chinese population and Confucian scholars in general. And they had very expensive expeditions to try to invade both Japan and Vietnam, both of which failed horribly. So all of this led to significant taxes, rebellions, and the eventual fall of the Yuan Dynasty. The guy most responsible for destroying the Yuan Dynasty is Zhu Yunzhong. Zhu Yunzhong was a peasant, much like the famous, uh, famous first Han Emperor, Liu Bei. He, he, at, at, at a very young age, Zhu Yunzhong's parents died, and so he was then uh, raised in a, uh, he was raised in a monastery, in a Buddhist monastery. And then the Buddhist monastery was burned down by a rebel faction of the Yuan. And so this led Zhu on his path to becoming a great war leader. His followers were known as the Red Turbans, and eventually this rebellion swept across southern China, and Zhu Yunzhong was able to march into Beijing, displace the last Mongol emperors, and declare himself the Son of Heaven and his new dynasty, the Ming Dynasty. Upon ascending to the throne, Zhu Yunzhong took up the title of the Hongwu Emperor and did a number of different things to reestablish his rule. First, he established a law code, a strict legalist law code with clear laws and punishments. He also allowed religious tolerance in the empire. Different from previous Chinese societies, the Mongols had brought in large numbers of non-Chinese people who spread their philosophies and ideas. Buddhism was already well established in China, as were traditional religions and philosophies like Confucianism, but now Islam was also was also widely practiced, and so the Hongwu Emperor allowed the continued practice of Islam, the building of mosques and Muslim schools, and the promoting of Muslim officials. And so, China became a more pluralistic and a more uh, a more pluralistic and representative society. He still followed legalist principles most of the time. Quote, let the state be strong, small, and the people few, so that the people fearing death will be reluctant to move great distances. So legalism, of course, harsh, like strict laws, harsh punishments to keep people in line with the idea that people are inherently evil and need to be guided by governmental structures. He reestablished, he, or he continued, the Mandarin system with the imperial exams and the Mandarin bureaucrats of different ranks based on how many of these exams that you've passed. He reopened, he got rid of the quotas and reopened up the top layers of government to Han Chinese officials, which of course was very popular amongst the predominantly Han population. He established new irrigation systems, or his government established new irrigation systems. They reopened and redredged the Grand Canal, opening up trade, and they cut down on the amount of paper money in circulation, thereby, thereby ending the financial crisis. And so all of these things established order and provided legitimacy for the Hongwu Emperor's new Ming Dynasty. As Jean-Baptiste de Halt said, uh, established that the quote, the only, so in China, the great and only road to riches, honor, and employments is in the study of Chinese classics, history, the laws, and morality. And then if you use this in the Mandarin system to pass these examinations, you can be elevated to great status, and this provides generational security and wealth for yourself and your family. And so families in this system would encourage gifted students to study and apply themselves, knowing that a good score passing several layers of these exams would be a path for the family to become wealthy for a long time. The Hongwu Emperor established a uh, secret police force known as the Jinyi Wei, or the brocade-clad brocade guard. 
when they were when they were not in uh, disguise, they had these sort of brocaded uniforms and these secret badges that they would show to people, and then uh, they could act as the eyes, ears, and hands of the Hongwu Emperor, rooting out rebellion and ensuring that everything happened according to his will. The Hongwu Emperor also <coughs> tried to imply or tried to apply Confucian philosophies, living by so live, providing an example. Quote, I was able to do this, let's see, during the final years of the Yuan dynasty, there were many ambitious men competing for power who did not treasure their sons and daughters, but tries, prized jade, silk, coveted fine horses, and beautiful clothes, and relished drinking, singing, and unrestrained pleasure, and enjoyed separating people from their parents, wives, and children. I also lived in that chaotic period. How did I avoid such snares? I was able to do so because I valued my reputation, reputation and wanted to preserve my life. Therefore, I did not dare do these evil things. So protect my reputation and preserve my life. I've done away with music, beautiful girls, and valuable objects. So despite the fact that he followed legalism as a standard philosophy, he brought some elements of Confucianism back in order to, rep uh, in order to emphasize filial piety and the proper place of people within society. In the later years of the Hongwu Emperor's reign, he became incredibly paranoid that his government officials were plotting against him and started a series of great purges, killing huge numbers of government officials. The, the largest controversy was something called the pre-stamped document controversy. In order for documents to be official, they would have, the orders would have to be, uh, so the question would be asked, the, document, the government official would then write down a plan of action, that plan of action would then have to be shipped back to the Hongwu Emperor to be officially stamped, and then before anything could be done, that document would have to be carried back to the provincial official before it could be put into place. In order to save time, because this system was extraordinarily inefficient, the palace, some of the palace officials started pre-stamping documents before sending them out to the government officials, just giving broad instructions. Then the government officials would write down what needed to be done, and then they could put it into place without the extra step of shipping everything back to Beijing. The Hongwu Emperor was worried that these government officials were acting without official sanction and started huge purges, again, putting, torturing, and putting tons of these government officials to death. This led to a significant decline in people's enthusiasm to take these imperial civil service exams and led to a decrease in the quality of Chinese government in general. And in the end, it only stopped, these horrible tortures only stopped after one government official decided to speak out against them. He went in front of the Hongwu Emperor, bringing his own coffin with him, assuming that he'd be put to death. He then told the Hongwu Emperor that his actions were angering the gods and he was losing the mandate of heaven and then he lied down in his coffin and prepared to be executed. The Hongwu Emperor was so inspired by this official's loyalty that he didn't put him to death at all. In fact, he took this, he took this to heart and stopped purging his government officials, even, even stopping his favorite punishment, the waste chopping, which is like taking a human-sized paper cutter and cutting people in half, and cut back on the number of people he exposed to the nine familial exterminations which is where they would bring the official before you, kill all members of their family, wiping out their entire clan, and then put them to death last. So in the later years of the Hongwu Emperor's reign, he, uh, he, he went through a series of purges and then finally gave them up. After his death, control of the empire passed to the Jianwen Emperor, the Hongwu Emperor's grandson. The Jianwen Emperor wasn't, wasn't a warrior or a strong leader like the Hongwu Emperor. He was a bookish kid who allowed uh, some of his government officials to do a lot of the ruling for him. This outraged Zhu Di, his uncle, and the Hongwu Emperor, one of the Hongwu Emperor's younger sons. Zhu Di decided that these, government, these nefarious government officials were whispering poison into the Jianwen Emperor raised a rebellion to try to remove these officials, not to seize power for himself, because that would be totally inappropriate, but just to remove these officials. He then attacked the palace of Beijing, took it over, and then somehow, during the assault, the palace caught fire, and the Jianwen emperor unfortunately burned to death. And so most reluctantly, Zhu Di took the throne from his now unfortunately dead nephew, declaring himself the Yongla emperor. This usurpation, or maybe not usurpation, don't put me to death, uh, don't put me to death, Zhu Di. This maybe usurpation outraged some Confucian officials, and so we had to have another whole round of purges. More people were chopped in half by human-sized paper cutters. And my favorite story is Fang Zhaoru, who, uh, who, when, who came in front of the Zhu the who accused Zhu Di of usurping the throne. He was then chopped in half, and then in his own blood, 
he wrote, uh, so, so the Judy threatened to uh, give him the nine familial exterminations. He then famously said, never mind nine, go with ten. Saying, kill ten layers of my family, not just nine. Judy chopped him in half, and then he wrote usurper in, in his own blood in front of Judy. So, but uh, very few people followed his, his example, and in general, the Yongle emperor was able to ascend to the throne and rule effectively. The Yongle Emperor also constructed the Forbidden City, which is a massive palace complex within Beijing to hold all of the imperial family, the government officials, the mandarins, all these people. They managed to move all of these stones and build this massive palace city through uh, putting, a, putting a layer of ice and water on the roads and freezing them during winter and so they could drag the stones more effectively. This was an incredibly expensive undertaking, but it showed the vast wealth and power of the Yongle Emperor, and it's still one of the most important tourist sites in Beijing to this day. This became the seat of Chinese government for almost the next four centuries, with a short interlude where they moved the, the capital to Nanjing, which we'll talk about later. Commerce during the Ming Dynasty expanded rapid, rapidly. The size of the Chinese economy massively grew and expanded, as did the Chinese population. Money flowed into China for all their, from all their valuable trade routes, and China again became the center of global trade and the richest society on earth. Judy, the Yongle Emperor, also greatly expanded his, uh, in his secret police force and had the size of his army in order to consolidate power. And so these, uh, these agents know, became known as the Eastern Depot, quote, they were not limited to political and military affairs, but covered a wide scope of activities. The depot agents check out periodically the market prices of various foodstuffs, such as rice, beans, oil, and flour. They also reported the agricultural business conditions of the court. They went around Beijing almost daily in disguise, canvassing the streets for suspects, visiting government offices, particularly the Minister of War, Ministry of War, and listening and taking notes at trials. And so the Yongle Emperor, again, greatly expanded the secret police force, ensuring that he would have absolute control over all aspects of his empire. In his later years, he got paranoid like his dad. He, uh, the, young, the Yongle Emperor really wanted to outdo the Hongwu Emperor in just about everything, including purges of government officials. So he started purging his government officials, accusing them of disloyalty. There wasn't even a pretense of a pre-stamped document controversy. It was just putting them to death. And then the still not yet finished Forbidden City caught fire in a lightning storm. And Zhu Di took this as a sign from the gods that maybe he should stop killing government officials. And so, in the, so he stopped his great purges without even someone having to lay down in a coffin. So, way to go, Zhu Di. He then re-emphasized, he backed away from legalism in these later years and re-emphasized Confucianism, trying to focus on ruling as an example to others, not necessarily through horrible punishments and chopping people in half and exterminating nine layers of their family although he did still have the secret police force and all that. So here's some examples of filial piety. My favorite one is, quote, Wu Meng of the Jin dynasty was eight years old and served his parents with extreme filiality. The family was poor, and, in their, and their bed had known mosquito netting, so every night in the summer, many mosquitoes bit him, gorging on his blood. But despite their numbers, he did not drive them away, fearing that they would go and bite his parents. This is an, this is an example of extreme love for parents. So, uh, I don't know what you're doing, but if you're not protecting your family by allowing mosquitoes to gorge freely on your blood, you're clearly not living an example of an ideal man in Confucian society. Judy also established, uh, set up these amazing naval voyages, promoting the famous Muslim Admiral Zheng Ha and giving him a massive fleet of treasure ships. Zheng Ha went on a series of expeditions all across the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. These massive ships brought gifts and treasure to these, uh, all of these different regions and in exchange received gifts, treasure, and tribute in return. These were more or less sort of goodwill expeditions, but also reconnecting China into this global trade network and establishing the preeminence of the Ming Empire across the world. And then, of course, after seeing the wealth of China, tr many traders would come to China in order to get their fabulous products. Zhu Di used all of this wealth to build infrastructure and to encourage trade. The Silk Road reopened again, and specifically, Chinese tea began to be shipped around the world. Tea was an exclusively Chinese product, the secret of which having been carefully guarded. And so tea became one of the most sought after trade goods throughout the Indian Ocean trade network. And China, especially ports in southern China, became a hub of global trade. 
And so, the Yongle Emperor's time is one of the golden ages and one of the greatest uh, moments in Chinese history. And so here's a poem of praise to the Yongle Emperor. Quote, mountain bridges in endless layers, trees luxuriantly dark. A radiant shimmers on dark green mountains arrayed to face the sun. Standing tall in the blue clouds, they nearly reach the North Star. Covering a vast distance, they link the Great Wall and the East Ocean. The roads penetrate the remotest lands to bring foreign emissaries. Heaven created this deep pass to fortify the imperial capital. The empire is unified with standardized measures and scripts. We might well make a rubbing from a cliff inscription to send to the emperor. So all is well under heaven. The, the Middle Kingdom is unified, wealthy, and incredibly powerful. This, established, this establishment of foreign emissaries created this tribute system by which people bring gifts to the emperor of China and in exchange get greater gifts in return. This, this encouragement of trade brought new products to China. Uh, the Yongle Emperor specifically loved the awesome unicorn that he got from Africa. You can see here there's a, the, the unicorn that he got. And was so interested in, in these unicorns that he had a number, a number of other unicorns shipped in from Africa. In exchange, people would go, for Chinese, would, uh, go to try to trade for Chinese trade goods, specifically silk porcelain, especially this sort of blue tinted porcelain that we now refer to as you know, China which was very popular during the Ming Dynasty, and then, of course, tea and other Chinese products. During this time period, we also had the height of Chinese cultural growth. We had already talked about the, uh, the, the style of art on the Chinese porcelain. Chinese, uh, Chinese art to art focused on natural themes. The Yongle Emperor compiled the world's first encyclopedia, including, uh, so there were, thir there were 11 different copies of this, and, um, and it, they, they contained all of the knowledge the Chinese society has had accumulated up to this point. And they apparently built a fabulous porcelain tower that was, one, uh, that was so unbelievably beautiful that it just took away people's breath once they saw it. Uh, China is trying to currently rebuild the tower. The original tower was struck by lightning and destroyed during the next Chinese dynasty. But this was a demonstration of China's wealth, power, architectural prowess, and just general China being the peak of civilization during this time period. In the later years, the Yongle Emperor established a principle called rectify faults and shortcomings by which government officials could anonymously submit complaints to him. And so as long as you could slip this complaint into, this, into the box without the secret police seeing you, this would allow him to take in more information and to be able to rule more effectively. He also rebuilt the Great Wall, at least the current version of the Great Wall that uh, you, know, you see in pictures here. This was built during the Ming Dynasty in order to, again, protect against barbarians from the north. It required massive amounts of labor and cost a huge amount of money, and so that, this was pretty unpopular. But again, what are you going to do if you go against them? Secret police is going to show up, and yeah. Plus, all the people arrested by the secret police make a great labor force to help rebuild this wall. So Ming Dynasty rebuilds the Great Wall. And in general, <coughs> and in general peace and order was restored. Quote, anyone who violates our village ordinances will be sentenced in public, and if he thinks the sentence is unfair, he can appeal to the village assembly. From now on, our ordinances will be properly enforced, and the morality of our people will be restored. The Yongle Emperor died on campaign. He wanted, to, uh, his leg he wanted his legacy to be peace in all of the Chinese empire, and so he launched an assault uh, attacking the Mongols to the north. He was able to defeat several different Mongol tribes in battle, and then died away from the capital and uh, after a successful campaign. In the aftermath of his death, uh, officials were worried that, this, that his death would lead to unrest, and so they did the famous Chinese uh, tactic of refusing to acknowledge the emperor's death. They locked, put him in a coach and uh, brought him back to Beijing, claiming that he was just sick and ill and could not come out. And then they used uh, barrels of rotten fish to disguise his increasing stench. But they managed to get back, and the Hongwu emperor died and was replaced by a younger, by one of his grandsons. Over time, the Ming Dynasty started to fall in power and prominence. One of the worst incidents was the Tumu incident, in which China, the Chinese Emperor Ying Zhang launched a campaign against some horse riders who had been threatening him. This army of almost a million men was destroyed by only by several thousand horse riders on account of the Chinese army's really poor training, and the emperor himself was taken prisoner. The Tumu incident, the Chinese emperor being taken prisoner, led to the elevation of one of his cousins. And then when the emperor was released several years later, he came back 
had the he came back, had the the cousin arrested and thrown in jail, and executed all of the government officials who had recognized his uh, his cousin as. In the, this restoration, we had a series of bad emperors, my favorite of them being the Zhongde Emperor. Zhongde emperor. Uh, the Zhongde Emperor uh, was famous because he, was, uh, a, a, he came to the throne as a teenager. He uh, really liked hunting, and so he would often travel around and hunt. He was famously almost killed by a tiger that he was trying to fight that mauled him, and so he almost died because of that. He once spent the equivalent of $8 million on, on lanterns for a lantern festival, almost bankrupting the government. And then he finally decided that he didn't really want to be emperor anymore, so he demanded that everyone called him, call him Zhu Shu, and instead uh, pretended that he was a general and had a bunch of fake war campaigns that he went on. And so the dynasty began to sink during the Zhongda emperor's reign. And in the later years, officials became incredibly corrupt. Most famously, a guy named Hai Rei took, uh, spoke out against these corrupt officials and then were banished. He's going to become a symbol of good government and speaking out against uh, corruption in the future of China. The Wanli Emperor, and uh, especially his, uh, his government official, a guy named Zhang Yuzhong, apologies for the really poor pronunciation there, <clears throat> brought China back to glory to some extent, cutting down the number of government officials, getting rid of a bunch of the bloated bureaucracy, and bringing back effective government for a time. But the Wanli Emperor had too many problems sort of happening around him, he launched campaigns to both attack, to, uh, to both uh, defend Korea from the Japanese, which we'll talk about when we get to Japan. He had, there were rebel campaigns in the West and in the South, and these three campaigns drained the treasury and eventually led to substantial corruption, waste, and eventually the collapse of the empire. So that's the very brief story of the Ming Dynasty. When we come back next time, we're going to introduce the Qing Dynasty, the dynasty that's going to replace the Ming Dynasty, and the final imperial dynasty in Chinese history. So, that, those are our objectives. Thank you for listening.